Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members, officers, members of the public, welcome to the planning committee. There are no fire drills or tests scheduled for today, so in the interest of public safety, if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and the public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble a Queen Victoria statue in front of the civic offices. In order to comply with the Portsmouth Cultural Trust Fire Marshal's regulations, please remember to sign out when you leave the building after today's meeting. For those of you who have not attended this committee before, I will explain the running order for this morning. After committee members have declared their interests, agreed the minutes of the previous meeting and had the updates, I will announce each item and ask those of you who are here to make a deputation for that item to come and sit at the table. After the planning officer has made the presentation for the application, individual deputies will have six minutes to express their views and joint deputies will have 12 minutes between them to make their views known. I will explain later, I will be a little flexible on that matter. After you have made your views known, you will take no further part in the proceedings unless we need to ask a question to clarify a statement that has been made. May I emphasize that? We, this is not a meeting for general discussion, it is a meeting for deputations. After that, members will ask questions, make comments, and make their decision on the application. Both members of the committee and members of the public are reminded of the need to consider material planning matters and not to refer to any personal information about other members of the public. May I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed, that is filmed, and the recording will be on the Council's website. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly do they, that they do not wish to be recorded. The camera focus on the chair during the deputations, but those will be heard by those watching and on the recording. Finally, may I ask everyone to use the microphones provided when they are speaking. End of official comments. First of all, I think for members of the public here, it would be useful to know who is sitting around the table. I am the chairman, I'm Councillor Hugh Mason, I'm a councillor for St Jude Ward. I'm Kieran Laven, I'm the planning solicitor. Jane Dodino, Local Democracy Officer. Juliet Gill, pr Principal Planning Solicitor. Councillor Judith Smythe, St Jude Ward, and Vice Chair of this committee. Councillor Claire UG for Charles Dickens Ward. Councillor Lee Hunt, and I represent Nelson Ward. C covers Stamshaw, Tipner, Buckland, and North End. Councillor Steve Pitt, Central South Sea. Uh, Councillor Matthew Atkins, I represent Koshman Wimmering. Councillor Terry Norton, Drayton and Farlington Ward. Luke Stubbsey, Steen Crowes Water. Councillor Frank Jonas, representing Hilsey. Alan Banting, Team Leader Development Management. Peter Hayward, representing the Councillor's Local Highway Authority. S.A. Caledo, Head of the Development Management. Ian Maguire, Assistant Director for Planning. There will now be a short test to see whether you remember all of those. Uh, uh, do we have any apologies for absence? No, I think we're a full complement. Sorry? Um, um, Councillor Jonas, are you um, representing Councillor Jones today? Thank you. All right, thank you. Can we have an apology from Councillor Jones? 
Okay, thank you, <coughs> Councillor Stubbs. We now come to declarations of members' interests. I think many of us are members of the South Sea Coastal Scheme Project Board and its predecessors and possibly the successors as well. Um, this, on this matter, I have taken the advice of the City Solicitor and Monitoring Officer and he is of the view that this does not constitute a material interest. I am also and have been for the past 14 years your representative on the South of England Flood and Coastal Committee which is a committee uh, which is a statutory committee which deals with the finance of things such as the um, matters before you this morning but I am also advised that since I am the council's representative I do not have a material interest in this matter. Are there any other declarations of members' interest on any of the matters? Councillor Stubbs. Um, on, the, uh, on the various flood defence schemes this morning, um, I live near the seafront, um, on the seafront. I have taken um, advice from the city solicitor, and this is uh, not a pecuniary interest, but I should declare it as a personal one. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pitt. Um, similarly to you, Chair, uh, I actually chair the cross-party discussion group on the sea defences and attend the stakeholders' advisory group, um, but I'm following the city solicitor's advice today and have got no predetermined view. And on the uh, Knight and Lee application in my capacity as Cabinet member, I have spoken to the applicant uh, on a number of occasions about more general things, but I've given no view whatsoever as to my likely support or otherwise at this meeting and have not reached a predetermined decision. Councillor Atkins. Uh, in relation to the application on Station Road, I uh, live at an address on Station Road, but I'm advised by the City Solicitor that is sufficiently far away that it, that is a personal interest and not a prejudicial or pecuniary interest. <coughs> Councillor Smythe. Chair, I'm on the uh, cross-party uh, discussion group about the uh, sea defences, and I believe that uh, should we not uh, take some measures and there should be a, a flood, I, my garden would be underwater been advised that that's not a uh, pecuniary interest as it's said with so many others um, uh, but uh, I thought it was just to uh, point it out. Looking at the flood maps I will get out my deck chair when, when your garden is flooded. Uh, yes, Councillor Stubbs. Uh, sorry, Chair, I didn't think I need to make, make a sec separate declaration, but following Councillor Pitt uh, and Smythe, I'm uh, also on the cross-party panel um, and have um, also had uh, numerous discussions about sea defences under the previous administration um, a while back. Yes, Councillor. So, a couple of things. I've really, a couple of points for orders. Can I just beg everybody? I can hear... But if you speak into the microphone with it re reasonably near your mouth, because even before I found it difficult to hear, uh, and I'm sure the audience, the people at the, uh, they want to hear too. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, I just wanted to ask about PERDA, if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, because we've heard quite a lot about PERDA in this election, and councillors not being able to, to attend or even say anything about some really quite minor events and being given advice by quite senior officers that they shouldn't uh, do anything. But I'm uh, just wondering, I'm sure you've been advised, and I'm great I wasn't able to attend your um, pre-meeting last night, just wondering how can this happen, the, the committee today, when there's PERDA and there's some very big decisions being made today, just as a matter of record, if that's all right. Um, well, regulatory committees are expected to continue sitting through the PERDA period. Um, I mean, it, I'm pleased that you've raised that in one way because it highlights the need to keep all discussion today strictly on material planning considerations, as I know you're all well trained in, um, but that's an especially sensitive point today. So, provided that it is strictly looking at planning merits and you sit, remember, as an apolitical pl um, planning committee with balanced membership, um, that's part of the normal machinery of local government that has to run through PERDA. Thank you very much. We come to item three on the agenda, which is minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of November 2019. Um, I will take them page by page. First page. 
second page, third page, and the fourth page. And so, no objections. I will sign them as a correct record of that meeting. We now come to Chair's notices. Um, dates of future meetings. There will be a meeting, uh, again, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning on the 18th of this month. This has been occasioned by the fact that we have a backlog due to the problem over nitrates. I also, for the benefit of one of the uh, deputies, intend to switch items 9 and 8 so that we will uh, deal um, with 142 Milton Road prior to dealing with the Knight and Lee application. Um, so, yes, Councillor. Chair, not for today because we're already here, but for the 18th, I think it'd be really helpful if we gave um, the uh, public an opportunity to see how we're splitting the agenda because we're going to have a break. We're not going to sit here for six or seven hours non stop. And if people want to do deputations, they a bit of guidance because I've had two people contact me to say they couldn't possibly take the whole day off not knowing when an application was going to be dealt with. So if we could split an agenda to say we'll deal with certain things before lunch and then afterwards, that might be more inconvenient for us because we won't know how long we've got to go without a break. But I don't think that matters. What matters is that the public know when they're taking time off to make a deputation. So could we please do that and would the committee agree? I see a lot of nods from the committee, uh, and I would ask the officers if this is possible to to show an approximate timing. Obviously, we cannot give an exact timing, so uh, before and after lunch would be, I think, quite useful. Okay, any other points which people wish to raise? Okay, can I have an update on previous planning applications, please? Uh, there's no update, Chair. Uh, we received uh, planning appeal decisions quite late yesterday, uh, which we will present to uh, members on the 18th. Thank you. Thank you. Update on the situation on nitrates, item 6. <coughs> Members, we will mention this perhaps in more detail as we get through to the agenda items directly affected by nitrates, but the very short uh, update now uh, is the interim mitigation strategy was agreed by portfolio decision making last week, yes it was last week, um, uh, and is therefore being used and applied uh, in coming to conclusions uh, for the preliminary appropriate assessments uh, for those relevant applications on today's agenda and indeed for the agenda items on the 18th. So we have now an active strategy in place uh, to manage nitrates, uh, the, the issue of nitrates associated with overnight stays for hotels and residential accommodation which is analysed and discussed uh, in the reports as relevant throughout today's agenda. Thank you very much for that update. We now come to the planning applications before us, and we come to the first planning application, which is South Sea Seafront from Long Curtain Moat in the west to Eastley Marine Barracks in the east. Would Mr. David Ramsey, Mr. John Thurston, Mrs. Celia Clark, Ms. Francis Graves, Mr. Charles Burns, Mr. Mike Dobson and Mr. Zane Gunton come um, towards the table. Um, there are not enough chairs for you. Right. Sorry? Doctors. My apologies, Dr. Celia Clark. I <laughs> Okay, fine. Right, may I have the officer's report? Are you doing this as just for item one, or are you going to make an overall report? on all of the subsequent 
uh, matters which are related to this. Can you do it at once, or? Thank you, Chair. It, it will be one presentation for items one to six on the agenda. Right. Thank you very much. Members have a few um, additional details on their update sheets and have also been um, provided with a copy of the full list of planning conditions. Obviously, the, on, on your um, report, it's just a series of, of headings. You have the full list of conditions. <clears throat> the, um, yeah, we can see the red edge of the application site. Um, it's obviously um, a rather large one by um, city standards at 55.75 hectares and a frontage of some four and a half kilometers extending from Long Curtain Moat in the west to his new barracks in the east. This image really is, is one about trying to sort of focus our attention on, on why we're here this morning um, listening to, to um, this proposed um, uh, sea defence scheme. Um, South Sea is at risk to flooding and um, you know, without sort of being um, over dramatic, that area marked um, in purple where the land is at its lowest um, in a um, sort of extreme weather event could be up to four meters depth of water. And you've got a few images there of, of, of yeah, illustrating um, the uh, disruption that such an event would have um, on access. Um, on the impact on over 8,000 residential properties within the flood cell and over 700 commercial properties. Um, it's also quite an unusual application in that um, you're being required to um, consider the impact on a whole series of um, heritage assets, children's ancient monuments and um, listed structures. Um, I've included this image um, really to, to show the fact that, that you know, this is, is something that has already happened. In the last five years, there have been a series of significant breach events. Um, and the um, uh, aerial image there shows some um, areas where the sea defences are identified as in a critical condition, others poor, and others needing attention. At the beginning and end of your report, um, it refers to the fact that there are specific arrangements con for considering planning applications that are subject of environmental impact assessment and the requirement for you to take into account the information in the environmental statement. Um, well, see, there are three overarching objectives for sustainable development, economic, social and environmental, and this report um, has been um, carefully assessed. Um, the likely environmental effects of the project um, um, subject to appropriate con um, conditions to deal with mitigation measures um, are it's considered the, to demonstrate that the sea defence scheme can be constructed in its entirety without any adverse um, impacts. And that's um, obviously um, confirmed also through the statutory role of um, Natural England. If I can take you through um, uh, basically the, a series of sub frontages on the top of page five of your report it refers to the fact that even though this is one flood cell for the purposes of dealing with this scheme it, it and and the fact there's variation between um, parts of um, the frontage um, there are seven sub frontages so the first one is at long curtain moat um, the primary defense is um, a vertical wall as well as uh, a short section of secondary defence um, between the monument and the design um, secondary solution for a bund in um, the next sub frontage. So I've got some images showing. So this one is showing the um, western half adjacent to the um, Clarence Pier car park, um, a vertical concrete wall solution. 
forgive me. And this is the western side adjacent to the Scheduled Ancient Monument. It proposes um, a new um, uh, uh, vertical um, defence wall that would be faced in natural stone to replicate the appearance of um, the existing heritage asset the Shows Ancient Monument sits in behind it. Here are some images, um, some visuals of you know, what that um, uh, might look like or would, would look like. Um, just skip through these. See, the opportunity um, for um, seating arrangements is one that's sought to be integrated into the project rather than you know sort of selected from a you know catalogue etc. So looking towards um, Clarence Pier, toward the car park, and this is the one in front of the car park. Also identifying opportunities um, for landscaping within the scheme. Within the next subfrontage, there isn't a primary defence. Um, it's one that could be developed and would need to be developed depending on the, um, um, the, the use of any redevelopment of that site in the future. The secondary defence solution is a grass bund along the um, edge of the playing field um, along Pier Road where um, the carriageway would have to rise up which you'll see in an image in a moment, um, and the bun continues round um, the car park associated with um, um, the, 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 the hovercraft um, link there. So this is an image of that raised bun and also the, the, the raised carriageway here. Subfrontage 3, South Sea Common, is um, a widened beach, um, then obviously a, a step revetment, um, the promenade. It includes um, a one-way route westbound and um, a, a cycle lane on the landward side, um, contraflow for travelling eastbound. The secondary defence is... The, the bund here, which would be a, a one in three uh, profile on the seaward side and one in ten on the common side, then tying in with um, the remainder of the listed park. Some other images, obviously, um, this um, part of the frontage has the Royal Naval um, War Memorial, and you'll also see um, here is one of the existing um, listed monuments. There is another one. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's probably easy to show in, in some other images. Another example um, here. I will come on to. Um, um, these heritage assets um, in a moment. Another image showing the um, pedestrian um, priority zone in front of the Royal Naval War Memorial. And then subfrontage four, South Sea Castle, is um, a rock armor solution um, with um, high ground and some new um, um, secondary defence solutions um, around um, parts of the, um, the batteries east of Selsey Castle. So this is the um, part of the site on this side of the Blue Reef Aquarium. Um, in your report, it describes the fact that the raising of ground levels for these seed events varies from naught metres to two and a half metres. And this is certainly one area where some of the most major um, um, land raising is, is necessary. 
It's an image of the um, promenade and the rock armour around Southsea Castle. And then this is the sub frontage five where the existing beach will be widened and combined with um, a step revetment. You can see in these images it also includes um, a secondary solution of an upstand wall um, the rear of the promenade and um, another one of the applications and, and uh, proposals affecting um, four shelters this is obviously showing one of them they will need to be removed from the site um, it repaired and put back and not exactly in the same places but they but where they go back is is meant to give some um, order to um, those shelters another image of um, essentially the same stretch just um, further to the east and then this is the proposal around South Parade Pier obviously there is already in a high wall but by the time the promenade has been raised there you know will be um, areas um, that will need um, treatment and um, embellishment some needs to sort of soften their harsh appearance um, I do believe I may have included an image and this is an ex just a series of examples taken from um, the partnerships um, planning design and access statement showing how um, treatments can be put into those vertical walls to um, give some um, interest and local distinctiveness um, but at this point in time we don't have those details that is something that would need to be subject of um, uh, a later planning application sorry a discharge of, of, of conditions the next sub frontage is um, Canoe Lake, the car park, Lumps Fort, and it's uh, a widened beach, step revetment again, shown in these images here. There is a secondary defence on the landward side um, of a burn that would go around the existing Lumps Fort car park. I've included this image to um, show a little further um, eastward um, retention of some um, parallel parking um, on the seaward side um, and the inclusion of contraflow uh, cycle route on the landward side. With regards to sub frontage seven, um, there is no intervention um, considered like to be required for the next 50 years, but there would be um, a long-term beach management and monitoring plan um, to ensure it, it, it continues to perform uh, its current function. I mentioned the fact that there are um, five listed building consent applications. Um, the images in this one um, show the um, removal and repositioning of six grade two listed monuments and their plinths. You can see from the image here that um, the existing locations are in purple and following the um, sea defense scheme the new locations are shown in red. For most of them, they are further eastwards, obviously with the exception of Crimean Monument at this end, um, moving further westwards. Um, this covers, uh, uh, makes reference to the um, alterations to the Royal Naval um, War Memorial, it's grade one listed. At the moment, um, I included this, this um, one to 10 scale image at the bottom here. This is existing um, ground levels. And you step up to the monument currently, which is um, shown here in blue. 
by the time the um, uh, raising of the road and promenade has taken place, um, there is need for um, raising of what is currently a planting planter um, to have seating facing um, onto the sea, and because of the sort of rather the sort of cliff-like wall, otherwise to introduce um, um, a seating arrangement facing um, landward. Um, so this is an image um, of the scheme showing um, steps down to the monument and this is, this is showing the pedestrian priority um, in front of it. Mm -hmm. The other one mentioned here is the alterations around South Parade Pier. It's because of the way in which land needs to be raised up um, either side of the pier. And the, the last two of those um, five LBC applications relate to um, works to um, the shelters, um, let's say reposition them in, in slightly different positions, but, but to bring some order to it. And um, obviously all of the um, lampposts that are affected by um, raising of, of ground level, um, they're essentially being sort of um, raised back up to that new um, finished level, although again, some of the columns um, are being repositioned. Um, the, the, the breaches continue. This, th there was one last week. I was hoping to find an image of that, um, really to bring into focus that, that the, you know, the situation you know, is, isn't static. Uh, this was a breach that happened um, last year. Now, one of the key issues that I've no doubt is going to get raised um, by um, many of the de deputations is the impact on those heritage um, assets. And, and that's where um, it isn't very often that you'll hear me say, we've assessed the significance, the impact, and um, for example, to Long Curtain Moat, the impact will be substantial. Um, that's the view of um, Historic England, that's the view of a conservation officer, um, and it, it's one that's raised in many of the representations. Um, now when the scheme first came in, it offered a series of potential um, options of how that vertical wall would be treated. Um, following amendments to the scheme and um, additional information that's provided, uh, and, and that has followed some other um, design work. Um, what is proposed is that um, that new vertical wall will be in natural stone um, to replicate the appearance of the wall that it's standing in front. But um, the report says it's, it's inescapable that an intervention of putting a new wall in front of a shared ancient monument is substantial harm. But this is considered to be um, the only feasible solution. It's one that um, Historic England have accepted. Um, obviously, it, it will still also require scheduled monument consent from them. Um, and in their updated um, consultation response following the amendments and the addendum to the Heritage Impact Assessment, their updated advice was to raise no objection to the application on heritage ground. However, Historic England did consider there were some, some issues and safeguards within their advice that need to be addressed. But they added, it has been our view that a considerable level of detail should be submitted prior to the determination of a planning application. However, it is at the discretion of the local plan authority to decide this and whether matters are to be controlled by planning condition. Your report advises you that um, subject to mitigation through conditions, um, it is um, um, our view that the substantial harm is outweighed by substantial public benefit of protecting um, 
homes, businesses, and obviously an important green infrastructure um, um, part of uh, you know, the, 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 the common. Um, Historic England also recognised the fact that, that that sea defence is there will also protect the Shedrinch uh, Monument um, into the future. With regards to other um, heritage assets, um, the harm to the Royal Naval War Memorial is um, considered less than substantial, but again outweighed by the public benefits. Um, it, it, it is going to change at the moment the, 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 the dignity and the importance of that structure is in part the fact that you, you, you walk up some steps in terms of its relationship to the sea. Um, um, but the scheme and the additional information, I, I, I showed you the, 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 the one to ten um, construction details of how um, an appropriate um, design solution has been come to. It, it, it will be in materials of the highest quality. It will be um, Portland stone to match the existing monument. But there is still harm. And in, this, in the same um, vein, the, the impact on all of those other um, monuments, shelters, three of which are listed, um, or, or of the lamp columns, it, it really is a last resort solution that you would uh, remove them and, and, and put them back. Um, but it is the only way of, of delivering um, um, the um, um, sea defence uh, um, um, solution. So, um, this proposal delivers a key and essential piece of infrastructure in the city and will contribute to its wider economic growth and regeneration. I've already mentioned um, the adequacy of um, the environmental statement. I've mentioned substantial harm to um, Long Curtain Moat and less substantial harm to other heritage assets that as part of your decision making you you have to come to the conclusion that it will be outweighed by the substantial public benefit. Um, new development will bring some disruption, inconvenience, some noise and disturbance. Um, the um, one-way system is going to change the local highway network. Um, but again, all, all of that impact is considered to be outweighed by um, the benefits of the completed scheme. So in light of that, the report um, tells you how this scheme um, is acceptable and capable of, of your support. So there are um, a series of recommendations, one of conditional permission subject to those conditions numbered 1 to 38 on the list that you have and listed building consent um, for um, the other five, uh, two to six on your agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Banting. Um, we now come to the deputations from members of the public. Uh, I think that given the importance of this matter to the future of this city, to just say you have two minutes would be far too little. Uh, I am prepared, therefore, to uh, double that and make a little more five minutes at the absolute maximum, and I will keep you to that. But um, I think it is important that the committee should hear the views of the deputies, um, and they should have at least a little time to expand upon their, their views. The, I will take the objectors in the order in which they are my paper first. So, Mr. David Ramsey. Chairman, Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to speak today. We are here to voice our strong objections to the application proposed um, of the Flood and Coastal Management Scheme. We are principally concerned with the impact of the proposed flood defences on Clarence Pier, which is my client's site. My clients own and operate Clarence Pier in South Sea, which is not afforded protection by the scheme, as the officer outlined. This is understood to be because commercial properties do not attract funding for sea defences. 
Contrary to this guidance, it is understood that Mozzarella Joe's restaurant to the east of Clarence Pier will be benefiting from a rock armour groin protection, which is a clear departure from government guidance. The Seafront Master Plan identifies Clarence Pier as a development opportunity and proposed sea defences would be detrimental to this aspiration. The sea defences sterilise the site by abandoning it to the sea and making development delivery harder in the future and significantly less attractive to the development market. My clients object to the application for the following reasons. The proposed grass bundling behind Clarence Pier, which, use, um, sorry, which use, users of Clarence Pier would need to cross to access the site, would reduce visibility of Clarence Pier from the rest of Portsmouth and the Common, and thereby impact the business operations of Clarence Pier by creating a barrier to this visitor attraction. The six-year construction period would severely impact on the business operations of Clarence Pier. Clarence Pier relies heavily on passing trade, access and opportunities to, for the public to park close to the attraction. Access to Clarence Pier would be hindered during the consultation period. It is considered that the economic impact on Clarence Pier would, should be material enough to require a more detailed understanding of the construction phase prior to the determination of this application. It is acknowledged that there will be a loss of parking and access to public transport during the construction works. This will be catastrophic to my client's business. We would therefore ask that information is provided so that this should this application be permitted um, to allow the South Sea Clarence Esplanade Peer Company to plan for the protection of its business. It is clear to my clients that the full impact of the application on their allocated sites have not been taken into consideration in the determination of this application. And it is clear that the proposed development would conflict with elements of the local plan and MPPF and therefore, therefore should be refused. Thank you. Mr Thurston. Mr Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for allowing us to speak today. Uh, one thing we want to make quite clear is that we're not here to delay in any way uh, sea defences to protect the residents and properties in Portsmouth. However, the current proposals do not protect the South Sea Clarence Esplanade Pier or surrounding land owned by the majority shareholder, landowner and landlord Portsmouth City Council, occupied by various businesses employing over 200 people along with residents. Since the first mention of sea defences, Clarence Pier have endeavoured to work with the Eastern Solent Coastal Partnership, but to date there has been no meaningful dialogue or concessions made. Having already set out serious concerns on the impact of future business operations and development, we have engaged the services of environmental experts who advise us that the current proposals would cause a flood risk to Clarence Pier, which currently does not exist. We are also advised that in light of most recent statistics, the current proposals would not offer protection beyond 30 years. If the current plans for sea defences were to go ahead, Clarence Pier would most reluctantly have to proceed with damage and compensation claims which are not calculated on a one-off event, but a one-off event plus tens of years into the future. We are talking in the tens of millions in damages and compensation, and it is imperative that you understand that at this time. An alternative scheme protecting the peer would cost far, far less than the level of compensation we have looked into the viability of residential development at Portsmouth City Council's instigation, but the cost of development is prohibitive and a developer could not offer what the peer is worth as a going concern. If we, Portsmouth City Council and the Eastern Solent Coastal Partnership can work together and agree on an alternative scheme which will protect the peer, <clears throat> it will allow the Clarence Esplanade Pier Company to remodel the pier into a destination offering diverse family entertainment and attractions in line with today's trends. No one should overlook the value of the millions of visitors that have flocked to our unique seafront. 
ladies and gentlemen, our objective remains the same either way. But we would much, much rather work with you than against you. So we would urge you to revisit this scheme in its entirety without delay, as there are alternatives which protect Clarence Pier, Portsmouth City Council, and properly protects the residents and businesses of Portsmouth. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr Thurston. Dr Clark. Um, many members of the South Sea Seafront campaign, including us, live in houses below sea level, so we're, and we're only 100 yards or so from the beach, so we all accept that South Sea needs new sea defences and, and that they are necessary. Um, we first heard about this scheme um, at the exhibition in St Thomas's Cathedral, where two alternative schemes were presented, um, at one soft engineering, one half hard engineering, um, and it was clear even then that there should have been two uh, options uh, of des on, on design, uh, which in fact we've only ever seen one, which is this, which is holding the line. Um, the point about the soft engineering scheme, uh, if you, it's online if you want to see it, says Portsmouth Island City, um, would have actually brought substantial improvements to the seafront, including three lines of defence, the beach, the mounding over car parks and toilets, uh, and a dike which would have tackled the flooding um, in the, um, uh, on South Sea Common. What we feel is that um, we'd like, we, from, from that point on, we asked to be, contribute our local knowledge and skills to the design processes. Um, and it's clear from even the Environment Agency's uh, recommendations uh, for coastal action groups, it, which is what should have happened here, um, th and uh, they actually say that there's a need for bottom-up approaches to coastal, uh, to coastal management, um, and that the process of community uh, participation should not be viewed simply as a tick box exercise, but as a process of local community participation from uh, from which mutual understanding can be fostered and compromises established. Well, that didn't happen here. We offered some uh, community planning experts to run design workshops, but in the end, only one was held in August, uh, and the things that we said there were not uh, really reported, but including the importance of that Baroque townscape and the fact that the landscape architect didn't understand its history at all. What we're saying is that other places threatened by the sea are much better at involving their local community and I hear, hear cite the Heritage Action Zone in Gosport which shares a planning uh, service with uh, Portsmouth um, and um, they're, they're, they're working to regenerate the depressed local economy by restoring the borough's heritage. Um, you'll have seen the object well-founded objections by uh, the Portsmouth Society, the Cycle Forum and other things. Um, and. Um, what we're concerned about is that there's so much of this application is in reserve matters. Will these details, when they're finally revealed, be shown to the public? Will we be able to actually comment on them? Um, one of those is the historic paving in front of Judith, yeah. um, in front of Long Curtain Moat, which was raised at the last meeting we had uh, with the East Coastal Partnership. Portsmouth, in competition with other seafront cities, tourism is absolutely essential to our economy, and the seafront is a vital part of what brings people here. We'd like to ask the planning committee to ask yourselves, is this really a good enough design for South Sea's precious seafront? Thank you. Uh, Francis Groves, Department of Architecture, University of Portsmouth. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say a few words about that because um, that's my address. <laughs> I'm, I'm not representing the School of Architecture. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> I'm, re I'm, I'm a local resident. And, okay, fine. And uh, I'm an architect, yes, but uh, I'm not representing the department. Okay? Okay, thank so you. So that's, that's very clear. Um, yeah, I, I kind of think that uh, the proposal um, as put forward by the, uh, the planning officer, it's, it's quite clear that uh, we're going to have to deal with uh, historic monuments and clearly we accept that, uh, that there's a need for um, 
uh, intervention in order to prevent flooding. So that, that goes without saying. But I, I would uh, reiterate um, what uh, David and John said um, earlier about Clarence Pier, which if you, can you flip back to, or what was it forward? I don't know where we are, to, to the plan for Clarence Pier. Because, uh, yeah, maybe that will do. You can see the bund uh, which, which goes round the back of Clarence Pier, which leaves Clarence Pier, there it goes, right the way around the back, so that Clarence Pier is just left to the waves should we have a catastrophic event. And I think that's slightly uh, missing the opportunity for a vision, in my view, for a vision for Portsmouth, um, which includes Clarence Pier. Now, one of the things about, um, Celia mentioned earlier, the uh, alternative proposal. The alternative proposal was to have a pier in a traditional sense, so that when you walked along the front, you could actually see the sea. At the moment, you can't see the sea. But some development there that incorporates both the primary defence and the secondary fence, I think would be much better than this, this proposal that is currently before us. So um, because of that, I would uh, support, uh, I would urge rather the committee to reject this application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Burns, Portsmouth Society. Chairman and members, the Portsmouth Society is grateful for this opportunity to present a deputation to this committee. Portsmouth Society is a voluntary organisation, we're a civic community society, uh, we're concerned with the built environment, and we've been serving the city for over 40 years. The, uh, we encourage our members to attend these uh, Solent Coastal Partnership events and we set up a group working with other organisations to look at the planning application when it was submitted. The, uh, the person who led the group works for the co-op and their uh, Southern Co-op in their offices at Lakeside and is today involved in a program that has to be run every month and hence I'm coming to present the draft uh, that he's given me. The scheme being considered today is very different to the earliest suggestions of a concrete barricade hopefully as a result of public demand to consider alternative ways to defend the cherished South Sea Seafront. It has come a long way since from 2017 but still has a way to go. To non-professionals the design seems to be a functional and altogether more sympathetic response to the existing cityscape, its history and what people enjoy about their principal piece of parkland for which we are appreciative of the immense amount of work that has gone into it so far by the Council, East Solent Coastal Partnership and those residents who have cared enough to become involved. The uh, planning team's summary for today's meeting should be commended. Presumably reducing the height of the proposed wall reduces the capital cost shared with government to one of ongoing maintenance of regular shuffling shingle back along the beach to be borne by future generations, but at least they should have better access to the beach and views over the sea which has been called for. It is noteworthy that after years of work the approval of a significant engineering project is lumped with other applications as if they were C4, C3 change of use our concern is that you spend more time arguing those sort of applications and considering where we are for, with this composite scheme. We are pleased to see Historic England interest in her heritage assets and we are pleased to support the seafront manager's uh, comments, comprehensive comments I should say. And whilst a number of our members were concerned about loss of parking on balance, we believe the cycle forum's plea for a continuous cycle route on the seaward side should be a condition. We are concerned that the review of the South CSPD started last year or just over a year ago appears to have stalled, and this needs to be boot started again to work with the evolving design. The scheme you are being asked to approve is dependent on planning conditions in mitigation for its lack of detail at stage of submission. 
It is, of course, an unusual application, as many bodies and individuals have commented, in that it has none of the detail expected the routine domestic or commercial application. So the very least we should expect is a joined up and detailed manifesto of how this will be determined and offered for approval, as allowing this application through without it is surely contrary to government's advice on using planning conditions to be agreed, but by whom? We question why the proposed 41 conditions are a mere list and not described as in other applications being considered to today. Although I think from what the planning officer said, you may have more detail now. Hopefully there's a full draft of the conditions available that members of the planning committee have seen on which to base their judgment. And maybe you should not vote this scheme through until you're entirely satisfied as to the diligence of the terms with the chance to review and scrutinise during the six years on site construction that you're being asked to approve today. As municipal diaries are generally clear, then perhaps you should split this planning committee into two parts and reconvene in a few days to look at the sea defence applications to give planning officials more time to better define and propose conditions that can then be debated. That was a remarkable, uh, on my watch, four minutes and 58 seconds. <laughs> um, Mr. Dobson, uh, representing the Portsmouth Cycle Forum. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, Councillors and Officers. I'm here to express disquiet that the concerns raised by the Forum have appeared to have been given insufficient consideration in the planning report. The planned cycle route will not meet the cycling objectives of the Seafront Master Plan, it will not meet the NPPF criteria, and it will not comply with the Department for Transport standards. The plans are a retrograde step, worsening the local sustainable transport infrastructure. Portsmouth is already one of the most dangerous places in the country to be a cyclist, and the plans for a different seafront cycle route will make cycling even more hazardous than it already is. Last week, the Forum received an inquiry from the Council's new Climate Change Strategy Officer. He, asked, he said, It will be essential for the City to encourage more people to walk and cycle in the City. What barriers have you encountered for improving cycling? However, the city has been encouraging people to walk and cycle for at least four decades, with notable lack of success. Analysis of numbers of cyclists across the city in the weeks of Clean Air Day for 2018 and 2019 showed a 26% fall in the number of cyclists. Something is wrong. It's getting worse. This scheme is not going to make it better. According to the 2011 census, adding together St. Jude's Ward and East and Crane's Water Wards, 457 households have three, four or even more cars and vans. This is unsustainable on our small island, but it appears that Port City Council considers retaining 224 parking spaces on the seafront to meet this unrestricted parking demand is more important than road safety, active travel, reducing air pollution, and climate change. Like a drug addict promising to go clean, but begging for one last fix. So Port City Council is a car junkie, repeatedly promising to deliver that 40-year-old pledge of modal shift to active and sustainable travel, but instead it's kicking the can down the road demanding more and more fixes of more car parking. The decision to prioritise car parking on the seafront over safe cycling is wrong. It's wrong on climate change, it's wrong on sustainable tra travel, it's wrong on air pollution and it's wrong on public health. The Cycle Forum earnestly requests reconsideration of the plan for a revised seafront cycle route. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gunson, you have six minutes, but since I have been flexible with the other uh, 
deputies, I shall certainly be flexible in your case. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. As many of you may know, I could probably talk about this scheme for days if I was given the opportunity. Um, not giving you the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will take this opportunity to try and highlight the key objectives of the South Sea Coastal Scheme and to convey the really complex journey we've been on with this scheme. We are an island city, um, the only UK island city, and we have a really rich uh, maritime history. We are a very culturally important seafront destination. But with that comes an added risk of coastal erosion and coastal uh, flooding. And climate change is increasing that risk. That impact is becoming more and more real. And it's an impact that we see on the news more and more often. We see communities devastated by flooding. And our current sea defences, as shown um, up there, are not fit for purpose at the moment. They do not uh, provide us adequate protection. They're at the end of their serviceable life, and only this weekend we had another failure just in front of uh, the common. This scheme is an opportunity not just to protect uh, people now, but protect future generations as well, um, and against quite significant storm events and reduce that risk to over 10,000 residential properties. Um, it is also an opportunity for redevelopment, for regeneration, because actually with that reduced risk comes an increased um, confidence in development. And over the last four years that I've been involved in the scheme, uh, we've undertaken a wide and varied amount of consultation and engagement, um, including going to schools, talks, uh, and other things, neighbourhood forums and others. We've also had 30 uh, public engagement events um, over key parts, key times of the design. And at those, we've had 4,500 people come through the door and nearly 1,000 on one day, which is a massive amount of engagement. We've received nearly nearly 3,500 um, feedback surveys from these, all of which have fed into the direction of our design. We've set up workshops uh, and the Community Stakeholder Advisory Group, which has allowed the public and other people to really um, interrogate the design and the design team, um, and also allowed us to listen to their expertise, their knowledge about the seafront, and again, feed into the design. We've had um, a lot of one-to-one -one meetings with all the businesses that are affected along the seafront, and we've tried to understand their aspirations and minimise the impact, both during construction and afterwards, on their businesses. We've worked incredibly closely with all the statutory stakeholders, taking on board their requirements, their concerns, and embedding those into the design as we developed it. And I think there's a quote somewhere saying that it's an unprecedented pre-app process that we've gone through, making sure that the local officers are also involved in the development of the scheme and all of their um, concerns are taken on board. So at each key point, that feedback, those concerns, those recommendations have helped us shape the design. If we look back at what was actually um, presented to the Environment Agency, our outline design, it's clear evidence um, that it's evolved, it's adapted, it's taken on that feedback. If we take just a look at a few of the examples, um, talked about South Parade Pier. So in our presentation, I think three years ago now, it showed an opened plaza option, it showed a heightened wall, it showed a staggered option. All of these options were rejected by the public. And our team went away and worked really hard at finding a solution that brought down those defences. But with that, became a higher reliance on the beach, a wider, larger beach, um, which, as Charles said, will actually mean that future generations will be the, bear the burden of making sure they are maintained. We look at Long Curtain Moat, which originally was a stepped revetment down into the sea. We had safety concerns around that. And Working very closely with Historic England, we've been able to find a solution which is acceptable along there, and it protects that historic asset as well. Um, we look at Clarence Pier, and we have worked with the um, owners of Clarence Pier to try and find a solution along there, um, but it's not technically feasible to run a primary defence line without absolutely redeveloping and rebuilding that whole area which is not something, unfortunately, that we can do under the government funding. But we have taken careful consideration 
to the secondary defence line, ensuring that it's the last area we develop, giving us time to work with the owners there to look at redevelopment options or individual property protection solutions. That secondary bund is designed to be as soft as possible and adaptable and changeable with the future aspirations of that site. Uh, and then if we're looking about the common, our original designs on the common just raised the prom, not the road. We have now looked to raise the prom and the road with a gentle slope back into the common and an increased beach there. That maintains these key objectives that we've already always had throughout the design, which is to reduce the risk to the people of South Sea, to make sure that it lasts 100 years, that it takes into account climate change, that it makes sure it protects those important sea views along the prom, that we maintain access uh, to the amenity value of the area, that we look for wider benefits, and those wider benefits include sustainable travel, they include health, social needs, environmental benefits as well and wherever possible look for enhancements. So in real summary the scheme is going to reduce the risk to life, property, the environment and the historic assets there. It's going to protect them from coastal erosion, coastal flooding. It's also an opportunity to enhance the seafront and bring our historic assets to prominence. It's going to create a unifying spine along the coast which can be the catalyst for further regeneration and development. So as per the officer's report, we feel the scheme complies with local and national planning policy and therefore we ask the members here to, in line with uh, the officer's recommendations, approve it. But this isn't the end of our consultation. We are still going to be talking to everyone as we move forward through the conditions. It is coming to the end of your time, Mr. Thank you. And, and that is it. We will continue to engage with everyone as we um, deal with the conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you to the deputies. Um, may I suggest you now return to the public gallery and. Do you want a break before questions? So, so contemplate it, Pub? I'm fine. Right. Members, questions? Councillor Hunt. So, uh, am I right in assuming, <coughs> and I'm wondering what the evidence is, that we have accepted that cars will be going along the seafront with a um, road? Uh, I just wondered what the evidence was for that and how we came to that decision, uh, presumably by public consultation. I just want to know a bit of the context around that. And secondly, um, the strongest, <laughs> uh, the strongest um, uh, objection comes from Portsmouth Cycle Forum, and I do have a lot of sympathy with the uh, issues that they are raising. In particular, cars will be travelling uh, uh, in an uh, a westerly direction and that cyclists in a contraflow situation will be travelling um, east towards oncoming cars and I wonder what uh, will be put in to make sure that the cars stick to a low speed. Uh, I see the narrowing of the road of course but uh, uh, there are parts of the seafront as the cycle form raises where cars go very fast indeed and policing is very minimal if at all. So that's just a couple of questions I wanted to start off with uh, Mr Banting and I hope that you I was able to uh, make myself clear. I guess the difficulty I've got in answering your question is is <coughs> this is the scheme that's being presented to you. It, it has fallen out of a, a series of um, of changes over time and um, decisions around the desirability of um, retaining some parallel parking. Um, what we're doing is sort of speculating on, on um, you know, what would the scheme be like if we didn't have a one-way route, um, didn't have the, the, the parking, could, be, could there be a different solution for, for, for cycling? And I guess the simple answer is there, there could be, but um, there's a particular scheme before you that requires your consideration. So, under, thank you, Pardon, I'll stop with this one. understand that. I'm just wondering how this scheme 
I know there's been a lot of consultation, so I'm wondering what the evidence is that people want to see, people or businesses want to see um, uh, vehicles along the seafront and a road. So you, I think what you're saying is there have been a number of public consultations, and in those public consultations, the public has said they wish to retain a road and parking of some kind along the seafront and to see vehicles going along the seafront that outweighed the objections raised by the um, Portsmouth Cycle Forum. I think I'm just trying to drill down into the evidence that supports the view that we should have a road and uh, parking along the seafront rather than encouraging people to walk and cycle. I think within the body of the report I've mentioned that, that um, you know, th this scheme um, divides opinion um, and, and yeah, I think you've picked on um, a, a sort of rather sort of key area. Some would say no road at all would be ideal. Um, others would say well why do we want um, parking along the seafront? Um, but, but that is, is, has fallen out of, of previous um, consultations and um, uh, elements in the, the, in, uh, of the scheme that have been required of the, the partnership to take on board. Uh, Councillor Stubbs. Um, thank you, Chairman. I just want to explore a little bit about the scope of this application and which elements of this are actually falling within planning because we've been talking a lot about, um, I don't know, about um, uh, roads for an example or perhaps we could talk about materials but of course generally speaking the paving used on the road or the road layout or anything like that is it's a function for this authority to deal with but not the planning committee. I mean that's something which we would address with highways or, or maybe with the cabinet. So on these questions about the um, road layout, on the question of parking, uh, on the perhaps even on the use of um, paving materials and where the benches are located and all of that. Is any of that decided by this planning application or are these matters that are left open for determination by other, other bodies within this council? Yes, sir. <coughs> Obviously, You've got a scheme before you that, that tries to um, deal with um, the views of the public previously expressed before the application was, uh, was, was, was even submitted. I think the, the, the other thing to bear in mind is um, that it's predicated on a, on a sort of worst case scenario in that um, until um, there's a planning permission in place and um, funding can be secured, that the final detailed modelling as to whether um, plus 5 metres AOD on the primary defences and plus 5.5 on the secondary defences is needed across the whole of that site, it will come out of, of further modelling. And it may be that that um, sea defence that I showed you, the secondary defence on the back of the common, for example, um, You know, this one here may not need to be so great but it happens to be that this is a bit of a pinch point the um, width of the promenade is, is sought to be um, the, the same for, for as much of the scheme as is practical the, the beach is um, the primary defence as well and so it, it leaves you know, this amount of space now um, as high was authority could there be um, a, a different solution around having no car parking? Um, I'm sure the answer to that is yes. Um, but so ultimately, the, the scheme is about the fact that um, the beach, the promenade, the, the raised um, um, surface treatment within this width that's available, and uh, at the moment, what's identified as, as a need to be plus 5.5 of the back here that may change and, and may be reduced um, could offer um, the potential in the future for a, for a different solution. You know, I don't know whether you wanted to add it. Thank you. McGuire. Thank you. I think it's probably worth I'll just for uh, clarity, obviously highlighting the conditions uh, in their full wording that were emailed to members 
uh, yesterday and have been handed out in paper copy. I hope you all have one. If not, there's a few more to, to put around. Uh, as has been said, uh, this is a, a scheme that is provided in, in detail, but there are uh, further areas for enhancement uh, as, uh, as with any large scale infrastructure scheme. As the design matures, there will be opportunities to look at alterations. Uh, it has taken a precautionary approach on things like climate change, so some secondary and primary defence levels could change, for example. There are some areas where we think further distinctiveness and opportunity to enhance, such as feature walls, can be dealt with. Specifically on the two questions that have been answered, um, uh, have been asked. Uh, there are conditions, and I draw attention to conditions 23 uh, and 25 uh, and 27, uh, which are all requirements for further submissions for street furniture, hard surfacing materials, the roads and footpaths, to allow the, uh, that opportunity should uh, enhancements be able to be built into the scheme above and beyond that, which is a scheme which, as it stands, we as planning officers are happy to recommend is acceptable, but you know, should there are opportunities to make further enhancements, they can be incorporated through the submission of those conditions. Uh, a concern was raised by one of the deputies about how conditions are discharged, and indeed uh, the applicant's uh, representative also made the issue. Obviously, how you wish to discharge the conditions is entirely up to the planning authority, to you as the planning committee and the portfolio holder, and full public consultation and engagement can occur with those uh, in any way that we see fit as a planning authority. So for those that have significant uh, public interest matters, large-scale material finishes, for example, uh, a, a full 21-day consultation period, workshops, anything could be made available for things like piling uh, construction methods. You might not do the same thing, but that is an opportunity for the council to further engage with communities as the uh, design matures in those areas. But to answer the specific questions, what's for this committee to, to resolve? Uh, all matters of materials, layout, design are for this committee to resolve. They're provided within the application, but these conditions, the ones I've specifically flagged for you there, show how they're could be further alterations to those uh, and they would come back to this committee or to officers as the case may be uh, as that uh, scheme and the design of the scheme uh, moves forward. And I read, um, so just, just for my clarity, this is straight as to highways for the moment. So if I look at condition 27, um, I read that as, or I interpret that maybe wrongly, um, as meaning what you've been asked to do is to decide there's going to be a road, it's going to be at this width and this height, and the, the usage of it whether, it, whether it's one way eastbound or westbound, or whether there's parking there or not, or a cycle lane or so forth, it, all of that is outside of the scope of the, that condition. And that condition just says there will be a road that is this wide, and that the usage of the road will then sit with the cabinet member for traffic and transport. Um, am I correct in that interpretation? The usage of the carriageway uh, is not a matter for the planning committee, never would be. Clearly, some of the aspects to your question that came in, how are we going to distinguish between cycleways and carriageways, that would fall into the sidelines and curb question, how you're treating those different materials. So there's opportunities for the planning committee to take those positions. But fundamentally, who is using that road, whether it's a cycleway, a footway, or a roadway, and which direction they're going in, as always, is a highway authority responsibility, not a planning authority responsibility. We don't have any jurisdiction over, the, not through this committee, on whether, for an example, there's a cycle lane and how it's laid out. That is for decision elsewhere, other than to do with it where, where you put the street lights as a result. Yes, broadly. Specifically, of course, if the, scheme, the council feels that uh, this is an unacceptable scheme because it encourages the use of cars and discourages the use of cycles, that is a planning decision. You can make that judgment. But as Mr. Banting has explained, as always, it's a balance. Car access is necessary for those with low mobility. Cycle access is, uh, is a positive for uh, both cyclists and those promoting active transport. A balance you have to strike. But that balance, the overall provision, as described in the application, as is fixed in the application, uh, beyond the, the variations that I've described, is for this committee to decide today. Okay. I mean, just from a personal perspective, I mean, on the on the parking provision, for example, I mean, I, I perhaps disagree with some of the deputies. I do think we need to have parking provision for a destination. Um, but you know, there's and the way I see it, there's not much point in exploring the details of how much it is or where it is, because that's going to be a matter for a later date. Councillor Smythe. Um, my question is rather similar. Um, 
but it relates particularly to the cycling um, provision and the need for us to be a more active city and to discourage cars from uh, uh, people, generally to discourage car use in the long term. Um, am I right in assuming um, that, uh, and I think indeed uh, Mr. Banting has referred to that, that what we see here is a compromise between what the public said that they wanted in the various consultations and what people now want, but that actually what we would be approving is something that would be capable of change, uh, particularly in regard, for example, to um, cycling, um, which I am very <coughs> concerned that we this appears slightly retrograde in the, in the cycling provision, could then be decided later on, uh, obviously once we've got the basic sea defence uh, built and measured out. Is that is that correct? What we've got is this pinch point based on a design premise of this being plus 5.5 .5 meters um, then, and the reason why the conditions are written in the way that they are to deal with um, potential flexibility if um, and, and so the 5.5 .5 is the highest that it would be um, if it didn't need to be that high and so this embankment didn't need to be so um, wide, um, th then there may still be some, some sort of minor latitude. But at the end of the day, it, it, it is essentially um, the fact that in granting planning permission, this scheme has to be capable of, of, of being um, carried out. And that's the available road width to try and meet all of um, the aspirations, whether it's to retain some car parking, whether it's um, to um, make provision for cyclists, even though obviously anybody going westbound um, would need to do that on carriageway with with um, other vehicles going westbound uh, in, in, in the layout that we've got there because of the limited space that is available at this particular um, part of the site. Councillor Atkins, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, following up on the same point, perhaps I'm asking the same thing, but, but just in a slightly simpler form. So um, the, the plans that we see there of a road going westward, a contraflow cycle line, and parking, um, if we approve the application today, there will not need to be another application if the, if the decision was taken, say, to instead have no parking in a wider cycle lane. There wouldn't be another application, it would just be something that would be a decision taken later. If I may, um, that's what you're approving. The, there is a further application, the discharge of the condition, that will line up, um, li literally paint the lines on for those three things. Clearly then a carriageway is created. Um, if the City Council's Highway Authority two years later wants to change that, have an east facing road rather than a west facing road, have it purely cycling, have it no parking, that's a choice for the highway authority to make no further plan permission would be required. But uh, you're approving that layout, seaward parking, uh, west uh, traffic flow, east uh, cycle contra flow. We've asked for details just of the effectively the road marking and the surface materials so that we can ensure uh, they are of the, the quality we expect for the broader issue. But future changes to that, should the council choose to make this a cycle road, not a road, a, a, a car road, they can make that choice as the highway authority at any point they, they so choose. But to be clear, the applicant, the city council, has applied to the local planning authority for this layout as it, as it is shown on this illustration. Can I follow up? It, what about the, um, so you, it seems that the, the loss of width in terms of roadway and, and you know, the parallel part, the, the spaces that currently exist, the, the lengthway spaces, um, as, res, as resulted out of the, the higher bund behind. Is that correct? And would a further application need to be made if the, a change was made to the height of that bund to keep a larger, flatter area on top? If I, again, made the height of that bund, the secondary defence height, is again a matter for condition. We've put that into condition number 35. So if, again, as future modelling occurs, as the um, scheme matures, that height can come down, uh, that obviously does change the potential layout, and then further submissions can be made under the other conditions uh, to make uh, minor alterations to the scheme if that's available. If, however, there's 
if climate change assumptions change, for example, we get different modelling from the old agency, and a fundamental change to the uh, need for secondary defences or primary defence sites occurs, that may require a future application, but we're not anticipating that in the next couple of years. Councillor uh, Stubbs, then Councillor Norton. Um, yes, my other related conditions question um, is, um, we've got this condition about materials and so forth in there, um, is just, um, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's almost one, it's just something that there's been no public discussion about, and I think it's something that will be some public interest on, which is the potential loss of the rope motif. Now, um, and I don't have a fixed view on it, really, but I think that it is something which the public would be interested in. Um, and is that something, would that element of that come back to the planning committee, or would that be dealt with elsewhere in the council? I mean, I at least think it ought to be an explicit decision, um, whether that's through, through Caplet or somewhere else, rather than just something which is just done with no one ever saying anything about it in public at all. So, yes, the relevant condition does cover you know, uh, all, all types of type, texture, colour, uh, finishes, so any motif. Uh, it is to be discharged in accordance with normal decision-making processes. Certainly, I've, I've heard the comments you've made. I've heard the comments the deputations have made. It's a matter that the portfolio uh, holder will have to decide as and when that application comes forward, whether that comes to planning committee or is dealt with under delegated authority, what public engagement we do. It'll vary condition by condition, but I think the, the, the points you've made, the concerns that matters of uh, larger than local interest go through a degree of public scrutiny and then have public decision making either by cabinet or planning committee are, are very valid. I mean, I would, you know, I mean, I mean, part of me is tempted to say, well, we should um, insist that those conditions come back to the planning committee, although actually because it's spending money, it's really be better dealt with by the cabinet. It's just it's got to be done publicly. So if, if, if there's any commitment that any of the members of the administration can offer, it would simply be a public decision, then I, I won't make that proposition. Councillor Pitt. Slightly unusual, Chair, but since I'm being specifically asked, <coughs> as Zane said in his presentation, and Alan has tried to draw out as well, <coughs> and the words were used generally around this, the worst case scenario is the uh, it's a chicken and egg situation. We can't actually get on and work out what is what the art of the possible is until we make a firm decision about what is actually a minimum acceptable position. So the glass bum is a good case in point. Other things around this that need to happen, for example, a public art strategy is something that the stakeholder advisory group were uh, consulted on last week. That needs to be developed. What the finish looks like on the prom is something that also needs to be developed. There has been an ongoing process of consultation to get us to this point, which is a crucial point uh, in the process. However, I think the other members of the, who attended the stakeholder advisory group and have been part of the cross-party discussions as well would understand that this has got to be something that the public find acceptable. We would not be where we are now if, we, if those consultations had not taken place. And therefore, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to stop that process. It needs to be ongoing. And the more feedback and buy-in that we have from the people who live in this city, the better, because we have to end up with sea defences that not only we can all support, but that we know are supported by the public. So at every stage, and it looks right, that the decision needs to be made somewhere in, in terms of some of these uh, particular issues as they unfold, but they should always take place on the back of a public consultation that fully informs that process. It would be stupidity writ large to say that we're just going to go away and arbitrarily make all these decisions without talking to anybody going forward. We've got to where we are, but the process must continue. I think that was a statement rather than a question. Uh, but it, it answers, uh, it, was an answer, it was an answer to a question, yes. Okay, other questions from members? Uh, Councillor Norton. Thank you, Chair. My question is uh, about the effect on hover travel, and I may have missed this, but what reassurances can we be given that over the six years and beyond, hover travel will not be um, hugely disadvantaged? Um, the scheme has been designed to include um, uh, 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 going to keep the beach in place adjacent to um, hover travel. Um, so 
other than um, the, you know, this, the scheme makes provision to ensure that, that their continued activity um, um, doesn't um, adversely affect the sea defence. Um, um, the, um, there isn't really anything else. Uh, can I ask a question? Oh, I can certainly ask a question to follow that one up. Um, one of the problems which Clarence Peer Group have been having with um, the, with hover travel is the way in which shingle is blasted against parts of Clarence Pier. Um, is there anything in the scheme which will mitigate this? I don't know whether anybody from the partnership can um, offer any observations on this. Um, so, uh, are you saying? Are we talking about um, effect of shingle from the hovercraft hitting Clarence Pier? There's nothing within the scheme that will do that, but it's something we'd need to talk to Hover Travel about that's not part of the scheme, no. But in the other direction, the groin will reduce the uh, risk to the public. So the risk to the public. Um, but you will be discussing with the Clarence Pier uh, the mitigation which could be placed to the Clarence Pier side of the hover travel with? I think that would be a decision and uh, part of hover, travel, hover travel's operational rather than anything to do with the sea defence. Right. Councillor Atkins. Um, while we're discussing the, the shingle, um, I didn't spot, but perhaps I missed it in quite a long report. Uh, how much is the ongoing cost of maintaining the beach likely to be? Do we have any kind of estimates? Um, and is that a cost likely to be borne by the council going into the future, or, or would there be other sources of funding for it? If I was honest with you, I've absolutely no idea. But again, I don't know whether the partnership may be able to help you with your query. I don't have the exact costs to hand, um, but what we're looking at the larger part is a 10-year recycling program, um, which I can't remember off the top of my head the amount, uh, but those costs will be looked to be applied for from FDGIA, so Flood Defence Grant in Aid, uh, for beach management. So we'll be looking at that as would a future capital um, recharge of the shingle in that area. Councillor Hunt. So <clears throat> the question I want to ask is, has any study been done to look at the impact of this scheme on the visitor numbers to this area, and in particular Clarence Pier, because uh, the, 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 the um, port of plan that we have informs us that six million visitors come to this area, the seafront, and that, that represents 12% of the, uh, of the number of visitors coming to the, uh, to the south, uh, south Coast region. So it's an important uh, economic driver, for, not just for Portsmouth, but for the, for the region. And it's on, I can't remember, it's, it's PCS 9. I think it's in there. Anyway, it's in, it's in explanatory notes. So I'm wondering what has been done to study the possible impact that might actually improve the visitor numbers as a result of the scheme or maybe keep it the same or in, in some way have an <coughs> adverse impact on that very important uh, economic matter. It's simply that, that this sea defence uh, project wouldn't um, hinder it, w there would be no conflict with with national and local policy. But Clowns Pier doesn't seem to agree. Uh, they feel that the scheme, the way it's configured with the bund and a number a number of other matters, and I, I'm comforted by the um, uh, senior planning officer saying that this will be an ongoing process, we'll be talking to Clowns Pier, but they seem very sore about it. Um, making a very strong representation and, and, and making uh, not so much threats but making it very clear that they would look for compensation. I don't know anything about that. It's probably nothing for us to look at today. Nevertheless, they seem very sore about it 
And I was just wondering if there is any other, is there any better way um, to protect the actual pier itself? It seems to me quite difficult, <laughs> and we heard it's something that the government wouldn't fund in any event. But uh, but I just want to uh, have a better understanding about the <coughs> economic impact on that particular. Uh, location and the wider seafront and has any studies been done or any modelling been done to see how this might adversely impact or indeed improve the visitor numbers? Um, well, if, if I start by, if, if you go to page 26 of the report um, under the heading any other matters raised in representations there are a, a series of comments under the heading objection by South Sea Clarence Espen Peer Company on, on the variety of matters that uh, uh, Mr. Ramsey um, took us through in his deputation. But um, as part of the design um, evolution of the scheme, it, it, there was consideration given to whether there was a feasible solution um, um, along, let me find, uh, you know, uh, you know, along, let's say, that, that um, primary defence line that's on there. But um, imagine the scenario that, that, that um, I mean, it, it couldn't actually be on the sort of decked pier, but it, you would need a really high wall to run along that red line that in order that the public could, could get to the attractions would need to have a series of, of gaps. This would then be in private ownership and require um, um, flood gates or boards to be put up in um, a, you know, um, a, an extreme weather event, which is just the, the potential for, for it being the breach location. Um, I know that it was something the partnership looked at, and there was no feasible solution, um, hence the fact that it's uh, potentially the last of um, the phases to be done, and the Bund as a secondary defence is, is one that is, is capable of, be, of, of, of being virtually removed from, from that site. Unless, of course, the um, redevelopment comes, comes forward um, before um, the, the the end of the f the five to seven years that the construction takes place. Yeah. So, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just to labour this point a bit at the moment. So, so we have a number of policies in the plan that seek to enhance Portsmouth's reputation as a city of culture, energy, passion, offering access to sports and leisure, etc. A whole raft of um, policies in the seafront master plan that seek to enhance, uh, and actually there's some very good elements in this which I'm very pleased about and as Mr Burns said these are much better uh, uh, than before. But I just want to know, you know, what is the evidence that this, because we're supposed to look at the evidence, what is the evidence that this will enhance the tourism into our city that, you know, because uh, tourism and visitor economy represents an increasingly important part of our, of our city's um, income and jobs, etc. So I would just want to be, have a bit of understanding. Has anything been done about that to look at it or not? It's that, that 